Got it. Okay, John, I'll give you a brief intro. Um, I got uh, a message a few months ago from Erica, who I think may well show up later on tonight, um, asking me, I wonder, Dan, I was wondering if there's any plans on having a session on AI and how it can help the technical writer as well as beneficial AI tools. And I said, watch this space, Erica. And today we have that session. Um, you might recognize John from other um, Toronto uh, meetups that we've had. Uh, so if he looks familiar to some of you, that's probably where you recognize him from. And uh, let me just uh, launch into my spiel here for John. Uh, technical writers or documentarians sometimes have to interview subject matter experts, SMEs, for the deeper details of how something works. After asking the SME a number of questions, you then face the arduous task of converting all that gleaned information to, into some type of document. John is going to talk to us about how his new software makes this process a lot less painful, using AI to convert a transcript of an interview into a list of topics and do most of the writing for you. So without any further ado, here's Johnny. Hey, everybody. So uh, I'm John Davenport, co-founder of Discuss It. Actually, my, my co-founder, Emily Merritt, is here as well. So she'll be joining us for the talk. Um, for a better part of this year, I've been working on an application called Discuss It, uh, which I'll give you some demos of what I've been working on uh, during this talk, along with a couple other things. So uh, what we'll talk about in this talk, or we're gonna go over three different topics. I'm gonna talk about uh, the SME interviews problem from a, uh, a developer's perspective. I'm going to talk about several artificial intelligence and machine learning concepts that will be helpful regardless of whether you're interested in the product or not. And then I'm going to give you a demo of some of the stuff we've been working on. <clears throat> um, so I'm John Davenport. I've uh, done a lot of things in my career, done a lot of writing, a, a lot of technical writing. I've done uh, technical writing and basically all of the all of the jobs that I've had for about the last 10 years. Uh, I'm very interested in entrepreneurship and business. I've failed to start over 10 companies and I run a successful cleaning business. And then we're working on uh, the software business, which is actually going pretty well. I uh, got I got very interested in uh, software engineering in about 2016, and I've been teaching myself uh, how to write software for the last seven years. And most importantly, I'm a dad. I'd actually rather hang out with my daughter than do most of this stuff anymore anyway. Oh, looks like we got it. Okay, I just went the wrong way. So let's talk about um, SME interviews. Uh, Ultimately, this is about the fact that you need to document things that you do not have the time or the mental bandwidth to learn about quickly. Uh, so the way that we learn about that is usually by attending meetings, uh, having long drawn out conversations over uh, text medium and in person. And uh, the content of most of those conversations is highly unstructured, right? You can't boil it down to like, we're gonna ask some questions and have some answers. It's more like, we're gonna have a collection of monologues uh, and dial and like uh, informal dialogue and some questions and answers. And we're gonna have to ingest all of that information and uh, spit it back out in documentation. So this is like highly unstructured content. You can't really um, categorize any of it or understand it from a procedural perspective. Uh, it's generally very hard to schedule because as I'm sure you all know, documentation winds up getting pushed to the bottom of the priority list in favor of fixing bugs, in favor of developing new features and in favor of supporting customers. And uh, very often, all of this information has already been disclosed. Like they already had the conversations, they had the pitch, they had the design meetings, they had the conversations about 
how they were implementing it. They had the conversations about how they were releasing it, how they were building it. Uh, and so very often for the people who create this stuff, uh, having a chat with us winds up being fairly burdensome and annoying because they're just rehashing the same stuff that they've been talking about for the last uh, several months. So in terms of how one might solve this problem with an application, you have to ingest large amounts of audio and text input. You have to synthesize that into some sort of knowledge and you have to write one or more documents about that topic. Very often, these are very dense documents. So you need you know, a significant amount of context to produce one paragraph. So in my experience, trying to use uh, the current uh, text generators to accomplish this task is not feasible because it's very difficult to get the amount of context into this model for it to produce anything that's of value to us. Um, so I, I think that generally like using chat GPT or using Jasper AI or any of these tools outside of like a little bit of brainstorming and maybe structuring and coming up with templates, not very useful for producing technical content in my experience. Um, but regardless of that, uh, natural language processing and artificial intelligence are actually fairly well suited to solve this problem. You just have to do a lot more than ask for a technical document about your latest feature. So that's that's sort of my summary of of the problem from an engineer's perspective. Also, there's so few people here. If any of you feel like interrupting and asking a question, you go right ahead. Sorry, I keep going in the wrong direction here. So part of this talk is going to be going over some of the some generic artificial intelligence concepts. And I have two reasons for doing this. The first one is because I want you to understand what I'm talking about when I talk about my product. The second reason is that my perception of the dialogue around artificial intelligence is a media circus. And as a company founder, I do not wish to participate in that media circus. Instead, I would like to present content that is educational and realistic and helps people understand these technologies uh, better because I strongly believe that knowledge solves many problems. And what we see in the media around artificial intelligence is endemic ignorance that is perpetuated by companies who make lots of money off of that ignorance. So I'm going to start with a thing called vector embeddings. So uh, the reality is that this AI revolution has been happening in the background, in the dark, for like 50 years. And one of the fundamental technologies that's emerged in the last decade is uh, vector embeddings. And the best example of this is when you watch a YouTube video and it recommends you several other videos that you might want to watch next, if you ever wondered why it's so effective, it's because it uses vector embeddings. So vector embeddings are ways to come up with numerical representations of data that is of some arbitrary size. So essentially what Google does inside of the YouTube recommendation engine is to take videos and to create vector embeddings of those videos. And then at the conclusion of the video, it queries this vector database and finds the most similar uh, videos and takes some other information about your preferences and previous selections and uses that to recommend the next video. Vector embeddings are at the heart of recommendation engines, 
which are a fundamental, uh, it's, I think they're called uh, vector support machines. So these are, these are like uh, the technologies that support models when they are doing some of this magic. So here's how vector embeddings work. We're going to create a two-dimensional vector space that represents animals. This uh, two-dimensional vector space has two axes. One is brightness of color, the other is size. So on the left at zero, we have dull colored animals like elephants, rhinoceroses, and mice. And on the right, we have brightly colored animals like giraffes, crabs, and tigers. On the bottom at zero, we have small animals, and at one, we have large animals. So by representing animals in this two-dimensional vector space, we can now come up with a point, a vector, that represents an animal's size and color. So at 0, 0, 001001, 0, 0, 1, we have a mouse, and at 0907, we have a giraffe. And at you know, 001.9, 0, 0, uh, we have an elephant, et cetera. You can do this with uh, you, you and the the way that they typically do this in production is that you use a, a model. So you train a model to come up with vector embeddings for data sets of indeterminate size, like text, images, or video. And in the wild, most of these have like 768 or 1300 or 1500 dimensions. So it's like a highly abstract representation, right? Like you can't even visualize a, a, a vector in 768 dimensions. It's there's no like real world analog for this. So the next topic is called cosine similarity. So cosine similarity is the most common method for finding vector embeddings that are similar to, uh, to a vector. So a, a cosine similarity measures the difference of angle between two vectors or 10 vectors or 100 vectors. This is basically what YouTube will do, is it will say, this is the vector of the video you just watched. Find me the three nearest neighbors of this, of this video. So it'll go out and find similar content. Once again, given your preferences and the similarity of the video. Uh, and another like major revolution is uh, vector databases. So vector databases are, you know, it's just like uh, just like Postgres or MySQL. You put a bunch of data in there, but instead of you know using normal procedural clauses like where and order and this equals that, the intent of a vector database is, is to find the nearest vectors in the database. They do this very fast. Uh, and the defining technology in this area is FAISS. Most of the most of the commercial vector databases rely on FACE under the hood. And it's actually as a uh, open source project released by Facebook. Uh, two very common uh, commonly used vector database are Pinecone and Milvus. If you've ever heard of them. So the the Vector embeddings and cosine similarity uh, support most of the serious AI and machine learning applications. And the same is true for Discuss It. So that is, that is like the uh, AI and machine learning support technology. Uh, AI and machine learning uh, systems are largely composed of like, and this is the reason why we call, this is one of the reasons why we call this technology artificial intelligence is because we are basically taking a digital representation of the way your brain works and using that 
in software or hardware. So the way this works is it comes up with a network of neurons and each, uh, each neuron gets a weight and a threshold. And whenever it's exceeded, that neuron will fire and that will result in some sort of output. So you can really think of this, like if you're, if you come from a computer engineering background, this is an, it's an adder. So it's basically just an adder and it's adding up all of the inputs into the adder and it has a weight. So it takes the input, it multiplies it by a weight, adds it to all the other inputs. And then if it exceeds a certain threshold, the neuron fires, which in principle is how your brain works. And it has, uh, and in most neural networks, all of the neurons from one layer are connected to all of the inputs of the neuron on the next layer. And the way this plays out is that you take this neural network, and let's say we're gonna implement addition in our neural network, and you will feed it two numbers, and it will produce an output, and you will compare the output to the known correct answer. If it is correct, then it doesn't adjust the weights, or I'm sorry, if it is correct, it doesn't adjust the weights. If it is not correct, it will adjust the weights with some you know, rhyme or reason, and then it will try that input over and over again until the network is trained to produce the correct output for those given inputs. And the way that we train a neural network is to have a large set of data for which we know what the correct answer is for, and then we feed these inputs iteratively into the model until it reliably produces the correct answer for known outputs, and then you can continue to use it, and it will produce somewhat correct answers for unknown inputs. So that's the reason that uh, neural networks are such like a fundamental and important part of computer, computer science, because it's a way for you to take a huck of software and be like, I, this is the problem I want to solve. I know the question and I know the answer. I can feed it to this neural network and eventually it will produce the correct answer. And I don't have to write code to figure out how to arrive at the correct answer. So the uh, transformer architecture is a modern uh, architecture for neural networks. That is basically, uh, this is like a major revolution that's changed the way that, um, that uh, has changed the capability of artificial neural networks. And basically a transformer is a way to organize neural networks such that it will take a sequential input, such as a sentence, and it will decide what is important and related out of that sentence. So this is like, for example, this is critical for producing good translation because before transformers, it would just be like, I is J kicked is whatever the is this and ball is that and you would get a literal word for word translation of a of a sentence but by using transformers it's able to say it's able to understand how each word in a sentence is related to all of the other sentences and produce output that is more correct um this is actually an area that I'm not super familiar with, but that's my best, my best cut at explaining it. But transformers are very important for uh, the way that large language models work. So chat GPT and like all of these and Jasper AI and all this stuff, these are all based on large language models. And the funny thing about large language models is it's literally a model that plays Mad Libs really, really good. The way that they train these models is they take a large, like we'll take a Wikipedia article about chemistry and then we'll blank out a word in the article 
and then we'll feed the large language model all the text before that word, and we'll say, predict the next word. That's how they train these things. The only thing that the GPT model do, is doing is taking the prompt and the output that it has up till now, and you're asking it to predict the next word. So based on, you know, the, it's a bunch of neural networks organized into transformers that is predicting the next word. I'm telling y'all, it's the rise of the machines around here about an AI model that plays Mad Libs. This is like kind of how ridiculous uh, the media circus is. Hmm. Oh, right. An example. So this is an example of a application that uses a large language model. And this is my, this is the first product that we've released with Discuss It. So this is how it works. We're gonna feed a transcript into this application. The application goes through the transcript and it chunks out the text. Uh, we have a really simple chunking method mechanism in here. It just looks for two new lines and it says, okay, that's a chunk of text. For each chunk of text, it creates an embedding. Then it puts all of those embeddings into a vector database. Then uh, we will use cosine similarity to figure out which of those embeddings are the most similar. And then we group them up by topic. Then for each of those groups of text, we feed it to GPT-3 and it produces a summary of that text. So this is the topic analysis portion of the Discuss It MVP, which I will show you in a couple of minutes here. Then we have, I have a little like writing feature in the application. Basically what you can do, you can do this topic analysis and then you can do the topic analysis again to produce subtopics. And uh, basically it will go through each topic that you have in your outline and it will query the, uh, the vector database and it will find the most similar content. And then it will send all of that into the prompt to the large language model and ask it to write some text about the topic with the context, AKA the knowledge that it ingested from the conversation. You remember what I said earlier about not thinking that large language models can produce anything of value because they don't have sufficient context? Well, this is how this method actually makes it feasible for the model to produce something of value that you can actually use because it has all of the most similar knowledge from the conversation or conversations that you have fed into it. And then you just send that prompt off to GP, GPT-3 and it generates a draft for you. So, I'll show you how it works. So, actually, I'm going to do a little bit of this. This is a transcript of my favorite podcast, Software Engineering Daily. And this was an episode uh, about how DoorDash uses machine uh, learning to do logistics. And so I'm not going to click the buttons because it takes a long time, but I have run topic analysis on this conversation. And you can go in here and look at uh, the summaries that we came up with for each of these topics. 
uh, you and then this is an example. Like you can go, you can uh, analyze the subtopics if you want to. Like this is this is how I solved the outlining problem. Is you can break a topic down into subtopics and you can create a reasonable outline for a document. And then at the end of it, you can smash this write document button and it will go out and it will write a reasonable document about this conversation for you. And it's not perfect, but it's if you're coming from, you know, because I've had these experiences where I'll have one or more conversations with engineers and developers and then sit there with two hours of of conversation recordings and review and review and write and write and and it takes an it takes hours or days of time to get all of that stuff into your brain and come up with good documentation for it and uh though i believe that unleashing generative models on the general public is going to cause the internet that I know and love to be occupied by average garbage and for all of the valuable stuff to go behind lock and key and paywall so that people can't train their models on that. So I am of the opinion that what we are doing here is not about generating large amounts of text but more about summarization and analysis that helps you to get the knowledge into your brain and do a good job of writing about it. So that's what that's what discuss it is about and that's what my MVP is about is about helping you to ingest and learn faster. Um and I'm actually going to stop there. I have another demo that I want to show off and talk a little bit about where I'm going with all this. Um, but do any of y'all have any any questions about uh, the AI topics or the or the demo so far? Yeah, I do. A uh, quick one just to get us started. So um, how long would it take to generate this copy? Say that was a, an hour long podcast? Five or 10 minutes. Okay. Well, wow. And cool. A lot of it runs in the background. Like the first thing it'll do after you save the transcript is it will go through and embed all of the statements from the conversation. That takes a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. Then you'll run topic extraction. That takes a couple of minutes. You'll run the, the writing phase and that takes a couple of minutes. But yeah, it adds up to about five or 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, I'll go again. How how uh, long did it take you to uh, come up with this MVP? Uh, well, it took me it took me about sixteen hours to write. So I'll tell you the story. So sure. mm -hmm. I have I've been working on this problem since mm -hmm. about January, and you're going to see the fruits of those labors in a minute here. Uh, but I got to a point where I had done a lot of the procedural code and what I wanted to accomplish was mostly done. And mm -hmm. I was like, now I need to go and learn about artificial intelligence and support mm -hmm. vector machines. So I went and, and actually I was not, uh, this was an accident. So I had written another product called SME interviews that was intended to help technical writers conduct better SME interviews. And mm -hmm. it was a total bust because it was a simple question and answer application that only addressed a small portion of the actual problem space. So I was like, okay, I, I am going to do what I had always wanted to do with SME interviews, which is what you're looking at. So mm -hmm. I, over the course of a couple of weekends, I taught myself vector embeddings and, and generative models. And I wrote a little script that did this. And then I made a couple of posts on LinkedIn about it. And lo and behold, uh, somebody bought this from me. Mm -hmm. And I tried to get it running on his machine because it was just a crappy script at that point and totally failed. So 
Then I spent the next couple of days uh, throwing it all behind an application and getting it out into production. So like the, the core technology that drives this was built in about 16 hours. And, hmm. you know, I probably spent another, another like 25 to 40 hours getting the application to where it is now. Hmm. Wow. So wh here's what, and I should have put a slide for this. I actually don't know where that, here's what I'm working on. Uh, what I set out to build is this thing. And wow, that got really dark all of a sudden. Anyway, y'all are just going to have to deal with me being creepy for a minute. <laughs> so uh, I run this cleaning business and I, I use a phone system called Open Phone to do all the like sales and customer support and coordination calls for the company. And I was like, hey, wouldn't it be really cool if I could get all of my conversations from Open Phone and then write case studies for the cleans that we perform? So we can put them on the internet for SEO. So I did that. Like this thing is ingesting text messages from open phone and transcribing phone calls and putting them into this generic, uh, this generic conversation model. And then what I'll do on the other end is I'm going to attach these analysis, summarization, reporting, and writing tools to it to help people uh, write, uh, to help people understand what's being said, report on it, and write about it. So uh, my aim here is that I'm going to take the topic analysis feature that I showed you and put it on top of this application that is able to ingest conversation data from multiple sources. So like, you know, I'll get this topic analysis feature working over here, and then I'll very quickly move to pull conversation data from other sources like Zoom or Slack or Google Meet or Microsoft Teams so that at the end of the day, you can reach into a large body of conversational data from your company to uh, help you understand what is happening and what people know and be able to write stuff about that. So like, if you, re if you start looking at this thing and like, think about this, what if you have this and you start at like the very beginning, you start at the feature announcement or whatever, and you do your, uh, design calls and your presentations and some of the engineering chatter about building that product up and uh you know whatever qa sessions and whatever other conversations are happening about a particular feature and then run that through topic analysis to understand what's going on in all those conversations what people are talking about and what they know and be able to like reach in and get all that knowledge in a in bite-sized chunks that you can then understand what's happening and get to your writing a lot faster and sort of have the experts at your fingertips based on everything that they've said about the stuff you're writing about. Like, I confidently believe that all of the knowledge that's required to solve the problems that your business was created to solve exist in the conversations that your teams have with your customers and each other on a regular basis. And all that's necessary is to get all of this soft conversational data and turn it into hard information that you can use to move forward. And it solves so many important business problems. SME interviews being just one of them. Like what about collecting tribal knowledge from support staff? What about understanding what your customers really need based on what they're telling your team at scale? What about understanding which topics really push your customers' buttons so that your salespeople can do a better job of closing deals during customer calls? Like the, 
the possibilities for this technology are endless once you have uh, the conversation data to hand off to the model. I got to find a white screen so y'all can see me again. So that's my, that's my speech. And, and so is it the idea is to run this in real time eventually? Is that the yep. idea? Yep. And it'll pull, it'll pull in, you know, right now it's pulling in like every time a text message comes in, this thing is ingesting it. Every time a phone call is completed, this thing runs it through a transcriber and puts it in a database. So mm -hmm. like you can, you know, and, the, and like, to be fair, there are significant technical challenges about of moving from like, we're going to copy and paste a large transcript in here to we're going to ingest and analyze data from, you know, thousands of hours of phone calls. Those are those it's, it's a bit, it's a big challenge to solve, but it's completely doable. And the funny thing here is like the AI, the AI parts of this are far easier than the procedural parts. Like getting all the conversation data into this thing is, is harder than doing topic analysis or summarization against it. Anybody else? I um, I know you, I sent you a recording before this meeting as well, uh, John. Um, were you gonna try and use it on that? Or I guess it would be much the same, eh? If you were gonna hit extract data, it would take five to 10 minutes and we'd probably just be trimming our fingers waiting for that to go through. It broke my tool. Oh. <laughs> there were too many statements in it. So I couldn't make it work. Oh, okay. Which I've actually found that because like of the way, the way this thing does uh, topic analysis is by like building a cosine similarity matrix. Mm -hmm. So if you have a, if you have a, uh, something with like a thousand statements in it, then that's like a million data wow. points that you have to run through and analyze. So uh -huh. that's, that's part of the challenge of, of getting this to work from the MVP into an actual like running production application that does this at scale. Okay. So um, because I'm an idiot, explain to me. So so the it would work on the podcast, an hour long podcast, because uh, there were fewer statements somehow in the hour long podcast. Yeah, actually, I'll, I'll show you exactly, mm -hmm. exactly what it is. So mm -hmm. if we go in and look at write the docs January, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we've got like. So a lot of, yeah, at every every time there's like a two hard returns in a row yeah we're going to break it and we're going to create an embedding for that uh, and we're going to build this huge matrix relate uh that defines the relations between all statements and all other statements in order to to group the topics together so mm -hmm. like if you have five 500 statements that's two hundred and fifty thousand data points if you have a thousand that's a million data points and if you have 1500, that's 2.25 million data points. I see. And, and the, after a while, the thing just crashes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if you compare this transcript with the um, uh, podcast transcript, it would be, there would be fewer hard, two hard carriage returns in a row, I, I presume. Essentially what, you know, what you'll find with this uh, write the docs transcript is that like, uh, oops, hang on, sorry, mm -hmm. wrong place. Essentially, what you'll find with uh, the DoorDash transcript is that mm -hmm. somebody has like hand, you know, somebody's cleaned this up. Gotcha. So like where in the transcript that I pulled from Write the Docs January, it's like mm -hmm. uh, I, I honestly just copied and pasted it from Slack. And so there's a lot of like really short statements that are not like they're not really that valuable. So like, that's part of the, you know, that's part of the challenge here is like, how do I figure out mm -hmm. uh, what of that needs to be grouped together? Because it's the same person saying something. It's just that they said, okay, and then paused for five seconds and then said, I think, and then paused for eight seconds and said, 
and then said something important. So like, you know, these are all, these are all part of the challenges of making this work at scale. But if you have something like this, it, it goes through just fine. Hmm. And uh, anyway, so I did the, I did the declaration of independence in here for July 4th. Oh, what's happened? I thought I had this. We'll see if it does it. Uh, for some reason, this has gone away. So what I found about the, the Declaration of Independence is that it was largely composed of complaining. <laughs> the entire document was just them being like, oh, this guy, King George, he taxes us and he like takes our stuff and he's not cool and we don't like that and he's a bad guy. And and there's like two or three sentences that are actually them saying what they're going to do, which is basically we're going to kick your butt. And like, that's the entire document. Let's see if we can actually, because I've been concerned that I broke something, but we'll see if it's going to work. It may not. Looks like no. All right. I broke something. So, but that's what I found from the Declaration of Independence. Hmm. Cool. So what I'm wondering about is um, applying this not for necessarily for technical writers interviewing SMEs, but um, for SMEs themselves. Uh, so in my company, we have this whole requirements process where it's like everybody pretends they're agile, but they're not, and they have to write these big requirements documents. And for the, uh, you know, so the product people write the product requirements, and then the engineers write the engineering requirements. And especially for the engineers, it's totally like pulling teeth. And yet, if you get them in a meeting, they will talk your ear off. Um, so if there were you know, kind of a script where somebody asks them the questions that are the headings that they're supposed to have in their document. Um, could a tool like this then basically take what they said, make it, you know, cut out the ums and pauses and whatever, and make it something coherent that they could then edit to say, no, 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 what it really meant was this and so on. Um, I mean, the challenge for me is as a technical writer interviewing them is understanding what they're saying enough to ask the questions that are like, okay, but then what does the user do with this? So I have to like sort of preload the, the knowledge into my brain from the requirements documents in order to be able to ask those questions. But, mm -hmm. um, but I, 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 you know, I, I, um, I can I can definitely see how uh, this might aid them in what they need to do in terms of writing and make it less like pulling teeth. And yeah, I, th I think it definitely would. And so one of the one of the writing or one of the tools that I'm interested in developing for this, and I'll tell you about uh, the other one I have in. So like. I'm going to write a temporal summarizer. The temporal summarizer will take a conversation and provide daily, weekly, monthly, et cetera, summaries. Another feature I want to ship on here is a custom summarizer. And the way the custom summarizer would work is that you go in and you write up the prompt the way you want it. And then it will take a large conversation and summarize that according to your prompt. It's sort of like if you plugged chat GPT into, you know, all of the conversations that you've had. So you could essentially go in and have one or, you know, you could, you could start it wherever you wanted to, right? In theory, you could go be like, okay, these are the con the product conversations that we had. There were two or three of them. And then these were the engineering conversations that we had. And there were two or three of them. I'm going to, I want to, I'm going to feed this into the tool. I'm going to write a, I'm going to have a custom summarizer that says produce functional requirements for this thing with whatever other parameters that you have. And the, the tool will then go, it will manage, like you have to deal with this. This is an artificial, this is a large language model thing. It's called a context window. The thing will fig will deal with the context window and it, and like iteratively summarize 
the conversation until it gets to a final product. So like that is a excellent use case for what I am building. And it and it's sort of like like think about think about this like let's think about this for the whole flow of requirements generation. So like let's start by plugging this into the support and sales calls that y'all are having. And then turning this into this is hard data about what your customers want and what pisses them off. And then the product manager can go in there and take the first pass and be like, okay, based on what our customers are talking about, these are the requirements for the feature. And then you take those and have conversations with the engineers and they plug in the like complex functional knowledge about the application into a couple of more conversations. And then you produce functional requirements. And then you hand those off to people who whatever, draw pictures or write code. And they're able to then produce something that's like actually based on what your customers want and are talking about. Instead of this, like not to be mean about the way that this happens today, but not based on the biased opinions of people who are taking hours and hours out of their day to go and interview clients. So yeah, I think that that I think that the uh, requirements development use case is extremely useful and valuable for this technology. Ooh. See, that's pretty cool because uh, I've got uh, product managers that are, that's what basically all they do is listen to conversations of, of what our clients are telling them, what they're, what they're looking for, what their wish lists are. They hold sort of meet the, meet the developer, meet the, <laughs> meet the product manager type brain dumps <laughs> every once in a while, quarterly usually. And it's good biased at every level right the the customer is biased oh yeah yeah and, then, and they quickly discover that no two customers want the same thing exactly the same way either so yep. <laughs> it's always okay well what's the happy medium here are we going to do any of this stuff at all or are they just grossing for the sake of grossing <laughs> yeah and then the people who get the meetings are the ones who complain the loudest and it's a it it's not a it, it's it's sort of a broken process. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. It's so cool that you were able to uh, create this and such a short amount of time, I think, relatively speaking, right? Wow. You know, I have another, you know, uh, so I was on LinkedIn the other day and mm -hmm. there's this, uh, somebody posted a recording of an automated sales, an automated Tesla salesperson mm -hmm. booking a call, booking a customer to come into a showroom and test drive a Tesla. Wow. And everybody was like, Whoa. But as a developer, I look at this and the procedural parts of like the telephony aside, it's three API calls, y'all. Hmm. The first API call transcribes what the customer said into text. The second API call feeds the customer's statement into the chat completions API from OpenAI. And the third API call takes the response and feeds it to an, a speech to text engine and then plays it back to the customer. This is the really crazy part. Now, this is the easy part. The hard part, like for example, I'll give you an example of the hard part. The hard part is chunking. How do I take, a, how do I take thousands of statements made by a customer and chunk those appropriately so that I get daily summaries out of it without breaking the context window. 
That's mm. harder than getting this thing to analyze, to like do complex topic analysis on a large set of conversation data. The like the world of software engineering is flipped on its head. The hard stuff is easy and the easy stuff is hard. It's a weird time. Mm. But yeah, and I hope, you know, some of this stuff, uh, anyway, this is part of the reason why I like to go over the fundamentals, because when you start understanding the fundamentals, it arms you against all of the crap that people are peddling about this. Like when you start to understand the way this stuff works and what's achievable with the, with modern models, it really doesn't make all of this seem like such a big deal. Like if you're a tech, like, you know, depending on what your job is, like I use, uh, I use star coder in my IDE for, for software development. And like, it'll finish the back half of my function 10% of the time. And then we get on LinkedIn and people are like, all the coding jobs will be gone in a decade. And I'm like, so you're going to tell me that y'all are going to figure out how to get through the requirements gathering process that we just described and get from a highly complex set of requirements in a complex domain into functional requirements that a model can write code for in 10 years? I don't think so. That thing is playing Mad Libs, y'all. Like, I think this kind of important knowledge is important right now because I think mm. it's super easy to get very anxious about the way the future is going. Yeah. But a little knowledge solves that. And then the other thing that it solves is like, if you understand the fundamentals here and you get some idea of how to apply them, you are protecting yourself. And so, so I, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Uh, well, John, just because you opened the door um, and since nobody else is asking the question, I will ask the obvious question um, about how you think AI might affect other jobs in the future. Let's say, I don't know, technical writer, pick one at random. Um, so yeah. if you're, the, I think that the first way that it will, the first way that it will affect technical writing is that everybody who's willing to produce average garbage will start using these models to do their technical writing. Mm. And then fairly quickly after that, I think the people who are producing good content are going to rise above the people who are producing garbage. Like this is the way, this is the way competition works. People who do the job better get more business. So I actually think that a lot of people who like embrace this and start canning people, like the quality of what they do is going to suffer. I think that's a, like a fast approaching thing. I think that the people who understand how to use this sort of technology to achieve better results are going to be the winners. And like examples of, you know, like if you start looking at some very obvious use cases for this in technical writing, it's to send you a link to the document that you should be reading. And if you go back and like review the fundamentals of what we talked about, it's not hard, y'all. We're going to take your technical documents. We're going to break them up by paragraph. We're going to embed all of it. We're going to feed that into a model. We're going to attach a chat bot to that. Every time you ask a question, we're going to query your vector database. We're going to send that context into the model. The model is going to answer your question in an informed way and return you links to the documents that it referred to in order to arrive at that answer. So mm -hmm. like, that's one of the use cases that should be obvious. Like if you're, you know, if you're a professional technical writer, I think you should go track that down and help get it implemented pretty quick and get like, get to know the way that works and what the fundamentals of that technology are, because it'll be a huge benefit for you because let's face it, 
do you really want to send somebody else a link to a document on how to do blah, blah, blah that you've already sent out a hundred times? I don't think so. Hmm. So there are a number of, there are a number of ways. And like, this is what, this is what I a strongly held opinion on my part. We should be using these to improve the quality of our output and the quality of our lives, not to shit can people. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so my, my sense is that people who write mediocre marketing copy copy their their jobs are definitely at risk because it can ingest a whole lot of mediocre marketing copy and and produce more um but technical writers with real technical understanding the ability to bridge between engineers and users still are going to be bringing that to the table mm -hmm. um and yeah even through the that whole requirements process that we described it's like the technical writer or the UI designer is bringing the questions about the user perspective that those other part people um, didn't didn't contribute, um, you know. But I there is that that whole enhancing search and finding you the you know the real answer to your question. But again, it's it's you know the the thing that people seem to be running into is that models that basically confabulate or put together things that shouldn't be put together produce inaccurate results and so then how do you uh programmatically filter that so that it doesn't get back to the user um uh these hallucinations that are that they these right models yeah. generate yeah yeah and um there was a kerfuffle recently with the mdn web doc site where they tried adding uh, a, a large language model to it and yeah because not all of the results were accurate there was kind of a blow up and they had to pull it back oh. um but yeah. i think you know that sort of thing will be more common as long as mm -hmm. we can figure out the quality control part of making sure the answers are right sure yeah yeah, that, that's, thank you for answering that. And I, that is kind of what I've heard as well from more um, informed people. Um, uh, although I recently heard of a, a CTO who started at a company and one of the first things he said was, yeah, AI is going to uh, take tech writers jobs and the tech writers at that company were not impressed. I'm sure Especially they weren't. CTO say that, right? Sorry? I'm sure they weren't. No. I actually, so my opinion about technical writing is that I think that this is an age in which technical writing will flourish. Oh, okay. And mm -hmm. here's the reason why. Mm -hmm. All of the stuff, like all of the marketing content about a product leans on technical knowledge. Mm -hmm. It is essentially a emotional abstraction on top of things that you know about what you're trying to sell. Hmm. Technical support is an abstraction on top of knowledge. It is people communicating information about the product that you sell. And we can go on and on about this, about hmm. all of the positions that are essentially knowledge abstractions. And our job as technical writers is to write that knowledge down. And because of the way uh, vector embeddings work and because of the way that large language models work, they are basically going to live on knowledge. Mm -hmm. And so if that knowledge isn't somewhere for them to reference to, you have nothing. And if you want your large language model to work better, you need your knowledge to be better written down, right? Mm -hmm. So like, the people who are responsible for getting the knowledge on paper are critically important to the proper functioning of large language models. Hmm. I'm convinced. Cool. Oh, I feel better now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not as if you can go out and, and, and for a lot of stuff anyway, Google whatever it is that the software that you're inquiring about how it's supposed to be working 
you're only got a limited number of places that are going to have that information around. And generally, they've been created by technical writers. So as long as your company is producing original novel products, yeah. it will yeah. need an original mm -hmm. novel content about yeah. them. So. Yeah. Well, and even like, let's let's move on from there. Like, I don't know if you all have heard of this thing. It's called Gorilla. And this is a magical model that I think will actually write some code. And it writes API calls. Like it, the whole purpose of this thing is to write, because let's like, I'm an engineer. The last thing I want to do is write integration code. It's the most boring, like nobody wants to write integration code. So they wrote a model that writes your integration code for you. Hmm. But what does it lean on to write that integration code? The API documentation. Gotcha. Hmm. Without the API documentation, Gorilla can't write squat. And like the same thing is going to be true of like, I write primarily Elixir code. Elixir is a very niche language. How is the model? Like I understand it'll eventually get trained on all this, you know, the, the Elixir code on the internet and it'll write some Elixir code, but it's also going to lean on documentation. Like that's where the information is. That's where the example of how to call the function is. Like you need that stuff to make these models work and you can't train a model on generated text. So it's the lack of content to begin with to train these models is what potentially generates these hallucinations <laughs> that make stuff up. <laughs> well, it's not, uh, let's talk about that for a minute. <clears throat> let's go back. It takes the prompt and the input to this point, and it generates the next word based on, it's based on the statistical mean of what is available on the internet. So like a hallucination is a, it is a, it's a feature. That's the way it works. It's generating what is statistically the correct next word. It doesn't know, like people, talk about GPT like it knows something. GPT doesn't know anything. It's a neural network that's trained to play Mad Libs. It predicts the next word. It doesn't know anything. The only thing that it can know is what you can feed it based on these support vector machines. The only thing it knows is what's in the prompt. It doesn't know anything. It's statistically generating the next word. It doesn't know anything about, about if you say rewrite this in the voice of Disney Princess Jasmine. It doesn't know anything about Disney Princess Jasmine. It's just generating text because it was trained on a Disney script at some point. That's all. If you tell it to write like Ernest Hemingway, it doesn't know anything about Ernest Hemingway. It just was trained on his novels. That's all it has is it's just been trained on all this text. Mm. <clears throat> stop sharing. I don't have anything else interesting to show. Well, thanks for that, John. That was a really good uh, talk. Thank you. And I learned a lot.